So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. Verse 1. Uh, yeah, starting at verse 1 as we continue to talk about, as we continue to go through some of the messages that Jesus shared when he was on this earth in human form. We know he's still on this earth. We know that he lives for us, doesn't he? He never leaves us nor forsakes us. We know he always was around. If you look in the Old Testament, you know who you'll see quite often? You'll see him referred to as the angel of the Lord. They call the theological term a theophany. But we're looking at the sermons that Jesus shared, that Jesus preached while he was here. And we're in Matthew chapter 11. And we start a little bit before he started preaching here. Read in verse 11. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he depart from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? John the Baptist, was he a mighty man of God? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was he a man of great faith in God, who did great works for the Lord? Mm -hmm. But you know what John the Baptist struggled with? Doubt. You serve the Lord, you serve him faithfully. I thought that was doubting Thomas. Well, Thomas doubted too. It's not just one guy that struggled with doubt. I can tell you, ministry, serving God, just day-to-day -day life, there's discouragements that come about. Where was John when he mentioned this? It was right in the passage. Where was he when he talked to his disciples and relayed this question for Christ? In prison. In prison. Ministry is not always happiness and sunshine and hundreds of people coming into your church every day. I wish it was. That'd be awesome. But it's not. Sometimes ministry is hard. Sometimes life is hard. All of you who are married, you know, hopefully you don't regret at all the fact that you're married and you love your marriage, but even the best marriage paid for a lot of hard work, isn't it? And discouragement sometimes, and sometimes doubts. Am I really doing things right? Doubt is a pretty natural part of life. And even John the Baptist struggled with doubts. And I think it's important to look at how Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, how does God address our doubts? We read in verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So does Jesus badmouth him, say, Where are you? What are you doing, ye of little faith? he do? He points John to what God is doing in his what God is doing in this community. The great works God is doing. He doesn't have a harsh answer. He points John to the evidence. Because we can be discouraged and we can be depressed, but if we really look clearly, the evidence that the Lord is good is all around us. Sometimes we need to stop feeling and start observing. And that's what Jesus is showing John here. But what a compassionate answer. This, The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who created John, he didn't get upset. He isn't petty. He gives him the answer he needs to hear, pointing him to the evidence. I was thinking about another passage where another great man of God <clears throat> struggle with doubt. And uh, I was looking at uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Rumor has it that I am a big fan of Elijah. <laughs> I tend to use his uh, life quite often in messages. Elijah, in 
1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah. You know, John had a great ministry. And you think, how can John doubt after all that he's seen? Well, sometimes the people who've done the most for God also have the hardest doubts because their life is difficult. Their life is so hard. If you're serving God, life is a fight. Satan is always trying to bring you down. And that brings some real doubts. Elijah is coming off a great triumph here. Anyone know what the great triumph Elijah just had before this passage was? It was the great altar consumption of fire and water. Yes. Elijah triumphed over how many false prophets? Yes. God was proven true in front of all these witnesses. Israel's hearts are turning back to God. You'd think Elijah, and, and the drought ended too, by the way, that had been going on for such a long time. You'd think Elijah would be just on fire right now. Be careful when you're on top of the mountain, because that's where it's so easy to fall. When you're on top of the mountain, you don't have good visibility to see the attacks coming. Because you're up here and everything's coming from down here. On top of the mountain, you don't have anywhere to back into a defensive position. You take one step, you're tumbling downward. Yeah. So easy to fall when you're on top of the mountain. That's a place where we have to be at our most guarded. Because Satan is so great at knocking people down from the top of the mountain. I knew a guy in college that he was a really good guy. He was on fire for the Lord, went on a missions trip, came back so pumped up about what the Lord was doing. And a month later, he was boozing it up, fooling around, having sex outside of marriage. His life was a mess just a month later. How was it so fast? Because we, lose, we let our guards down when we're on top of the mountain. And the first time we get hit by a body blow, but God, how did this happen? We don't expect it. <coughs> We tend to think everything's going to go good now. Elijah, after all those triumphs, he triumphed over Ahab, he triumphed over Jezebel, he triumphed over all our false prophets. And in verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. How he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, Elijah just triumphed over everything Ahab could throw at him. You'd think he'd get this message and, oh, I'm not worried, God will deliver me again. But, I don't know, I think he probably expected after what happened that there's no way that there's no way this would happen again. Wouldn't they have woke up by now? The truth is evident for everyone to see. For whatever reason, this got to him. Verse 3, and when he saw that he arose and ran for his life, this brave man who stood courageously in front of the 850 false prophets, he put his life on the line by proposing that challenge. He knew what Ahab would do if that challenge failed. Beersheba, that's not Bathsheba, that's, two different, that's a place and one's a person. Right? Yeah, Beersheba is a place. Okay. So, this brave man, his courage failed him and he ran. He doubted that God could save him and he ran. Right after seeing such a great triumph, he ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He left his servant behind don't want him to die with me. You know? His servant, probably a more accurate way of looking at it would be, instead of a servant, it is more like that was his assistant in the ministry. So let's say that I, I, I'm running for my life and Jeff or Mike or Matt, or they're following me trying to keep up with me. Where are you running so fast? And then I just give them the slip in town because I'm so terrified for my life, I don't want them to die with me. That's where Elijah was. He was terrified. And he ran. You know, brave men and women can doubt too. They can struggle too. They can have fear too. 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree and prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He's just done. He's done living in fear. He's tired. He's tired of the abuse he deals with. He's tired. Sometimes we work so hard to get to the mountaintop that when we get to the mountaintop and we find out that the troubles are still there, we realize there's no way I can avoid it. I'm just done. I thought that if I did this, that things would get better. That I wouldn't have to worry about the attacks all the time. We all want an easier road, don't we? You work so hard to get your marriage to a place where you think it's so great, and you think you're past the arguments maybe you once had. It can be easily easy to get discouraged when one pops up, doesn't it? Can't it? Isn't it if, you, if, you, if you're always given the easy way, you don't learn any lessons from it? That's true. But we always... Even the people that go through the hard way, we want the hard way to end at some point. And that's why we're so vulnerable at the mountaintop, because we work so hard to get there. We sacrifice so much to get to that mountaintop. And we want to be able to say, now I've arrived. You know, if the things we've prayed for for this church, we get a bigger building. We get a merger. We get something great happen. And let's say this church is five times the size. You know it won't be gone? All the problems. Problems. They won't be gone. In fact, we'll just be painting a bigger target on us. Thanks for that word of encouragement. <laughs> the word of realism for the day. Yes. Satan is not going to give up attacking you when you're trying to build your life on the principles of God's Word. And that's a good thing because we would get soft and we'd get weak and we'd become useless if we didn't face those attacks. But they still grow wearisome. Elijah's tired. Lord, let me die. Haven't I done enough? Why do I deserve to live while my fathers are uh, dead? Verse 5, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked with, on coals in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back in the, the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So it's the angel of the Lord who we talked about earlier. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus. And what do we see God doing to Elijah in this time of doubt fortifying and fear? Him. Fortifying him. He doesn't come browbeating him. Shouldn't you have more faith? What's wrong with you, Elijah? Look what I did the other day. You should know better. God didn't say that, did he? God said, I'm here for you. God said, I'm here for you. Let me give you what you need to keep going. Let me strengthen you. He helped him. He encouraged him. He fed him. He gave him water to drink. He, you said angel of the Lord. That's God, right? Yeah. Okay, because they referred to him to angel and it confused me. Isn't it a blessing to know that when we have our doubts, when we have our fears, when we have our difficult moments, God doesn't give up on us? God doesn't quit. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. Jeff. Yeah. Praise God. He never gives up on us. He understands that life is difficult. And he ministers to us in the midst of our difficulties. He ministers to us in the midst of our fears. He never once attacks the doubt. Never once. He never once browbeats Elijah for lacking faith. He helps him. 
we need to understand that we can go to Jesus when we doubt. We don't need to feel like we're all alone. God doesn't attack us for having doubts. He'll strengthen us. Let's go over here. So we look at, uh, we move on looking at uh, verse 10, or verse 9, excuse me, or verse 8, my bad. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. So... That meal that God gave him, how long did it last, Elijah? How long did that meal last, Elijah, class? 40 days. 40 days. That's some good food, isn't it? I was going to say that, but I wasn't sure. God didn't just give him what he needed to get by for a day. He gave him what he needed to get by for quite a long time. In verse 9, And he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord our God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. You can tell God what you're afraid of. He understands. He understood Elijah. Any time he could have said, Look here, look what I did to all those prophets. You really think I'm going to let Ahab do anything to you? He could have said that. He didn't. God understands. Even if you think your fear might be irrational, because sometimes I'm nervous and then I think, Why am I afraid? What has God done to make me afraid? God's done everything so that I could trust Him. But even if my fears are rational, I can turn to Him nonetheless. And God understands. Even if you, even if you have some big, crazy, outrageous, dumb fear or something? Tell it to God. Tell it to God. Let him help you with your fear instead of trying to hang on to it yourself. You can tell him your fear. He won't look down on you for it. He won't attack you for it. And then what does he do here? We look in verse 11. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts before, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He repeated and that, so it must be really, really important, that part. Once again, he's telling the Lord what he's afraid of. He's telling the Lord why he's there. You know, we need to get good at telling the Lord what's really on our minds sometimes. He does want to hear it, even if you say it twice, or five times, or ten times. You know, you might go to your best friend and share the same fear a hundred times, and they get to the point where they're so sick and tired of it, they're just pretending to listen to you on the phone while they're doing something else. But God doesn't get like that, does he? Tell him how you're feeling. Let him help you with it. He can do a lot more than running can. He can do a lot more than being angry. 
or being frustrated or being discouraged can. Let God help you with your problems. You know, God is a gentleman. He's not going to help us if we're not willing to let him. But if we're willing to take our fears to the Lord, God can help him. So first thing we saw God do is sustain him. He kept Elijah from falling due to his fear. Then this encouragement here. Elijah gets to be feel what it's like to be in the presence of God. You know, more reassuring, I am there with you, Elijah. I haven't left you. I'm right here with you. And then third, read in verse 15, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your, on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, appoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint his prophet in your place. And we can stop right there. He gives him another job to do, doesn't he? Why does he do that? Because I don't know about you, but when I struggle with doubts and fears and I feel inadequate, I always wonder, God, how can you use me? I can't even keep myself together. God has a way of showing us that, yeah, I can use you. I'm not dumb with you. There is hope. There is a future. There is still a plan for you. One of the big things God will do, if you're willing to take your brokenness to Him, is show you purpose. Show you that He hasn't lost faith in you. He hasn't given up on you. And He still has a plan for your life. You know, we can think of all the things that we do this, so there's no way God will forgive me. God doesn't have a big list of that, does he? There's one thing God can't, we can't come back from with him. That's, we die without Jesus. That's the only thing. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, then, then God can bring you back from anything. Whether it's doubt, whether it's fear, whether it's sexual sin, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's theft, whether it's just a bad attitude, God can bring you back from all that if you're willing to let him. We go back to Matthew chapter 11. And we read in verse 7, As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you see go out what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's house. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly I say, to you among those born of women there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. So first off, you know when we doubt, when we fear, and we struggle, you know who doesn't think less of us at all? God. God. What a blessing that is, that when we feel like we've let God down sometimes, we haven't. God's still there for us. God he thinks, still loves God us. God thinks greater of us because he, he thinks we're stronger. Well, he still, you know, he hasn't given up on us. In my weakness, he is made strong. That's right. He doesn't think us stronger. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't think us stronger, but he hasn't given up on us. That's the point. He doesn't think less of John because John doubted. John feared. John was discouraged. He doesn't. John knew two times before who Jesus was. When Mary came to visit Elizabeth, and he jumped for joy in him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when he baptized Jesus, he knew who he was. Yeah. Yes. And what made him just doubt. Yeah, what made him doubt was mm -hmm. being in prison. Yeah. yeah. Too much time to think. Yeah. It wasn't club fed. Yeah, it wasn't. Well, and, and Jesus 
gave him nourishment by uh, by giving the scripture so he would know, yes, he is the one. Yeah. He's doing that. He gave John just what he needed. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus will do when we doubt and when we discour or discourage. He'll give us what we need. They, they, yeah. say, they say give all your cares to God because he's up all night anyway. Yeah, he had his doubts, but who did he go to with his doubts? He went to Jesus. That's right. Yes, the right one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he didn't go with his doubts to uh, the local Roman, uh, so local so Roman, so yeah, the local Roman soothsayer. He didn't go with his doubts to him. He didn't go with his doubts to the high priest, who was very much against Jesus at the time. He went to Jesus with his doubts. When we take our doubts, when we take our fears, when we take our frustrations to the Lord, He can bring healing. He can build us back up, which is what He is in the business of doing. And even here, in front of this multitude, He's telling people what kind of a man John is. But then there's a flip side to this too. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's something better than being a great man on this earth, isn't there? He was least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's the most important thing. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? You can be a great prophet like John. But you know what's better? To be in heaven with our Lord. be in heaven with our Lord, our, our priority, God does great things in our life, that's great, but our priority first and foremost, do you know Jesus? Are you a citizen of heaven? You know, there are many people who were pastors, evangelists, deacons, elders, pillars of the church, they ran the nursery ministry, they ran the children's church, Plenty of people like that who have come out that they weren't saved. John the Baptist is, there's, he says there's no one born of women that was greater than John the Baptist. But that's not our priority, is it? No. Do you know Jesus? The reason why John the Baptist has this comfort in the Lord isn't because he's a great man. It's because he has a relationship with the Lord. We have to make sure that we don't that we aren't here just because we love church, but we're here because we have a relationship with the Messiah. And we always have to talk about salvation because there are so many people that grow up in church, spend their lives in church, and give a lot to the ministry that don't know. Have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior? Because that's the way to be greater. It's not about us being better. It's about knowing the Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from, from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth of confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So do we know the Lord? I think it's interesting that Jesus builds up what a great man John the Baptist is, but he gets back to the kingdom of heaven. Where our citizens where is our citizenship? Because if we don't have Jesus and we're struggling with doubts, we're struggling with fears, we're struggling with anxieties, who do we have to go to? Satan will send plenty of people for you to go to, but there's one commonality they'll all have. 
they're all wrong. And they're all going to lead you further and further down that road of anxiety, down that road of fear, down that road of doubt. We live in a world where college students complaining about discouragement and anxiety, it's at an all-time high. The expenditures, the medical expenditures that they actually use on anxiety and depression treatments is actually at an all-time high nowadays. That's not an accident because we live in a world that more and more of our young people don't believe in Jesus. It's amazing how our anxiety and our doubt and depression goes hand in hand with unbelief. Because when I have those fears, I have someone to go to. So if you know Jesus today, understand this. You have someone to take your fears to. You have someone to take your doubts to. And he won't look down on you for it. He'll help build you up. And if you don't know Jesus, or if you're walking so far away from Jesus that your relationship with him is strained, you need to turn to him. You need to accept him as your savior. You need to build your life according to his word. You need to have a relationship with him. He's the one that can help you. Not a pill. Not uh, self-help books. Not alcohol. It's Jesus who can help you. Elijah was able to finish his life strong. And remember how his last moments on earth went? Ride the chariot. Ride that chariot, ride that chariot. <laughs> yes, riding a flaming chariot going to heaven. Is there any better way to say, yeah, you won in life? <laughs> he didn't even die. Yeah, praise the Lord. And he's coming back. Talk about a recovery from the depression. That's what happens when we take our fears to God. We triumph. We win. And if you have a problem with going to him, you can go to somebody like I do. A lot of times I'll come to Esther because I know she's a woman of God and I know she can lead me to the, the advice of how to speak to him. You know, she'll give me advice of how she would speak to him on a certain fear or problem that I'm having. And then it helps me go to him easier. Yeah, That's surround one way that surround yourself it. with people that will give you godly counsel, not bad counsel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I hope that uh, this has been a help to you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that you'd work on our hearts. We all get discouraged. We all have fears. We all have doubts. We all face them, Lord. But Lord, we thank you that you don't look down on us for that. You don't browbeat us. You don't get mad at us. You don't get impatient with us. You help us. You help us to overcome those. You build us up, Lord. So, Lord, please be with us. Help us to put these scriptures into practice, Lord, and take our doubts, take our fears, take our worries, and take them to you. Help us to give them to you. Help us to not be afraid to tell them to you. Help us not to be afraid to voice our doubts to you. That you're the first person we should take them to, not the last. And Lord, if there's anyone who's listening here in this room or on YouTube or Facebook who doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, Lord, I pray that you just work in their hearts. Help them to know there is someone who can help them with their anxiety and their fears. Help them to accept you as their Savior and begin a relationship with you today, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for your love for me, Lord, and your sustaining grace. You're the one who keeps me standing, not me, Lord. Lord, bless us as we leave here. Help us to have a blessing and a testimony to everyone we come in contact with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>